Have you ever noticed that some things are more tempting than other things? There are just those things that as soon as it crosses your mind, you just cannot let go of it. As soon as it crosses your heart, you just are ready to say or do whatever it may be. Have you noticed that? Well, there's a story of an older pastor who loved to fish. He loved to fish so much, not just because of going out there and being able to catch fish, but being able to go out and be in nature, to sit out on the water in his boat and enjoy the time to himself. Well, one Sunday morning, this older pastor thought to himself, boy, Lent has already begun. When am I going to find time to go fishing anytime soon? So being at a large congregation that he was, he said to his younger associate pastor, he said, this week you cover the sermon and the liturgy. He was already going to be preaching the sermon, so it was no problem, and and I'm just going to, I need to go to a conference. So the younger pastor took the service, and this older pastor, he loaded up his fishing gear in his car, and he went out to the lake. He got out in his little rowboat, and he went out about halfway. Well, meanwhile, this pastor, of course, did not go unnoticed. In fact, there was an angel who saw everything he did, and this angel immediately reported to God and said, God, he just lied. Should I tell the pr- one of the parishioners that they'll catch him? God said, no, 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 don't do that. He said, hmm. So the angel said, oh, God, should I tell all the fish in the lake to avoid his boat today? Well, God said, no, no. In fact, in fact, send the largest fish in the lake, the one that's been there for years, to his boat. Make sure it bites his line immediately. So meanwhile, we're down in the lake and the pastor's fishing. He's dropped his line and just settling in with his cup of coffee and his newspaper when all of a sudden there's a bite. Oh boy, he knows it's a big one right away. He starts wrestling with that rod. He's pulling it in and oh, he's got to let it out a little bit. He pulls it back in and oh, he's wrestling with it. Whew, he's got a sweat going. And finally, he's got that fish just hooked and he's got him pulling him in. Both of them are exhausted. He goes to get his net. Well, the angel says to God, I know, I know what God has in mind here. He says, I'll cut a hole in the bottom of the net, right, God? God said, no, 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 no. In fact, in fact, in fact, he's going to let the fish go on his own. The angel looked at him. He said, God, uh, I know you created these humans, and I know that you're well aware of human nature. How can you say he's going to let this fish go? This is the biggest fish he's ever caught. How is he going to let it go back? Well, God smiled knowingly and said, well, he can't bring it home with him. And he certainly can't tell anybody about it. He'll let it go. The moral of the story is threefold. First of all, God always knows. Second of all, even pastors are tempted. And third, don't skip church. However, isn't it interesting how those small things sometimes sneak up on us? Those things that we don't expect to tempt us, well, they're right there. Isn't it interesting how we, as our, we're Christians, maybe we don't expect to be tempted as much as the outside world. That, well, that's for those non-Christians, right? But then we know that there's those things in our lives that, well, they just get a hold of us. Those things that are right there for us, that right away we know that that temptation is going to come. Think about your own lives. Are there times in your life where you know there are certain temptations that you can't ward off, that you can't overcome? Are there temptations in your life that you thought, well, maybe as a Christian, who, uh, when I'm regularly in church, when I'm regularly studying God's Word, when I'm praying, these temptations shouldn't be affect me anymore, but wham, suddenly out of nowhere, Before you know it, you're already thinking, saying, or doing that sin you thought you had overcome. We may have in our minds this idea that only bad people are tempted. That those people who are criminals, the people who are ostracized or alienated in the news, well, those are the ones who are tempted. But I think quite the contrary, in fact. In fact, Satan goes more after those of us who are already Christians. Those of us who are in the grasp of God. Because his goal is to take us from God. His goal is to tempt us away. See, those other folks, those folks who are not in church, those folks who are already living their lives in a sinful manner, who ignore the temptation, Satan has those. It's as if he put the bait on the end of the hook, and he's softly, easily reeling them in. No, no. 
Satan goes after those Christians, those people who have strong faith. In fact, I would say more than anything else, he goes after those people who are most devout because those are his greatest challenge. He finds the weakness in each of us and he focuses in on that. Say your weakness is greed. Well, Satan will create opportunities where, where money is either you have too much that you don't know what to do with it all or you have too little where your focus is on that money. Or maybe if your temptation is lust or sexual sin. Satan will create opportunities where that lust is regularly before you, where you're constantly challenged. Perhaps, perhaps temptation comes to you in the sense of anger, frustration, lack of patience, instead of holding your tongue. Satan will create ways to put you right before those people who frustrate you most. Or perhaps it's that temptation to belittle yourself, to self-doubt, to distrust yourself. Satan will put those in your life, those thoughts in your mind, to make you think that you are worthless in the sight of your God. See, Satan takes those opportunities to focus in on our weaknesses. Are there any weaknesses in your life? Are there spots in your life where you know that Satan, that that's a spot he loves to scratch at? That he knows that once he lays out that bait, he has you hook, line, and sinker. That immediately he has you in his catch. C.S. Lewis talks about temptation in an interesting way. Perhaps you're familiar with the book, The Screwtape Letters. Well, he talks about, well, the premise of the book is there's a young demon by the name of Wormwood. He's just starting out as a tempter, and his uncle, who's well-seasoned demon, by the name of Screwtape, is giving him instruction. And this older demon is telling Wormwood, well, this is what you need to do to the patient, to tempt him. Well, their efforts, as we may see, are quite unsuccessful, and he does become cri a Christian and eventually dies in the faith, as oh, the book is set during World War II, and there is a bombing that takes place, and he dies and goes to heaven. So there is failure, and there's, it's quite interesting to read the outcome. But there's a very chilling line in that book as Screwtape is writing, giving advice to his, his young nephew. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. How true it is that Satan doesn't immediately drive us towards that temptation that we know is wrong. But how often does he take us to those small little sins, those things we think are insignificant? How often does he whisper to us, well, this one doesn't matter, this one's okay. How often does he whisper, well, it couldn't have been hell. The truth is, each sin that we commit drives a wedge between us and God. Each sin that we, are, that we commit separates us from God's love. Each sin that we commit is the one that the one that, me, that necessitates a Savior. Each sin that we commit is the one that we need Jesus Christ to die on the cross for. Today in our Gospel lesson, we have the beautiful story of Jesus overcoming sin, overcoming temptation. And as often as we fail to overcome sin in our lives, and often as we overcome, fail to overcome temptation, we do have that true promise of Christ who did overcome temptation, who did overcome sin. We do have that promise of our Savior who was successful, who was victorious. And He had to be. He had to be victorious because we were not. He had to be victorious because we had failed he had to be victorious because God's request, his requirement was perfection. But as Paul says to us, just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, 
so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Through the faithful obedience of Christ, through the faithful life of Christ, we have salvation. Not just because of His life, though, but because of His perfect death. Because He was that unblemished Lamb. He was that unblemished Lamb who died on the cross for us, who gave His life for us. He is the one who who gave His life on the cross for each one of us for salvation. And just a little earlier in Romans chapter 5, Paul says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, tempted by sin. While we were still sinners, separated from the love of God, Christ loved us. God still loved us. And He came as in the form of a man. He died on the cross so that we would have life with Him. That promise of forgiveness comes out of God's great love for us. When we, Before we knew it, at just the right time, Christ came. At just the right moment in history, when we wouldn't have expected, He came for each one of us. And as often as we are on this earth, those temptations will continue to afflict us. Those temptations that started from Adam and Eve on. Those temptations that continue the attacks and tricks of the devil. But we have the power of Christ. And that power of Christ, it's greater than Satan's power will ever be. That power of Christ was able to defeat Satan was able to defeat His power, was able to defeat death. That power of Christ is what renews us, what allows us to overcome temptation in our life. We are able to overcome temptation. Not by our power, not by our reason or strength, but by the power of Christ. Martin Luther says, there are three rules for theologians. And as we are all studiers of God's Word, we are theologians. Oratio, meditatio, and tentatio. These are three Latin words. Oratio, the first one. Reflecting on the proclamation of God's Word. That is us hearing God's Word, reading God's Word, studying God's Word, and seeing the wisdom of the salvation in His Scriptures. Meditatio, meditation. But not meditation on ourselves, or meditation on who we are, but meditation on God's Word. Meditation on God's Word in our life, in our world. Meditation on, God, on the Scriptures with other Christians, seeing how God's Word is working in their lives. And the last one, tentatio. Luther writes, Thirdly, there is tentatio, anfetum. This is the touchstone which teaches you not only to know and understand, but also to experience how right, how true, how sweet, how lovely, how mighty, how comforting God's Word is. Wisdom beyond all wisdom. Temptation in our, in our lives does not make us greater sinners. Temptation in our lives does not make us worse people than other people. Temptation in our lives shows us the love of God in our lives. Temptation is from the devil. Temptation is the works of the devil to lead us from God. But God uses those temptations to show His great love for us that while we were yet sinners, He died for us to show His great love, His great mercy for us. Through temptation, He renews in us His love, His strength. That one day, we'll no longer face temptation. We'll no longer face the difficulties of this world. But we'll join Him in life eternal. We'll join Him in the life that has no temptation, but only the joy of salvation. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank You that You have entered into our world, that You are the perfect atoning sacrifice for our sins, that You are the Lamb unblemished who gave Your life for us. We pray that You would help to strengthen us to overcome temptation. We pray that You would provide us the forgiveness of sins when we do not. Help us to see Your wrestling with the devil in the desert and know your power. Help us to see that, yet, that your, your, your victory was not just on this earth, but your victory 
was for all the earth. Your victory was over sin, death, and the devil. So that we may lose battles, but we know the war is won. Lord, strengthen us, guide us, and carry us each and every day. Amen.